Chapter 12, Peter's First Century Audience Regardless of any possible future application of Peter's writings beyond the church age, Peter obviously had a literal reading audience during the first century. He expressed his purpose of writing to them when he said that he desired for his audience to have a written record of truths upon which to reflect after his death. 2 Peter 1.15 Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For those who want to discount Peter's epistles for the church age saint, Peter wrote to his first century audience about being born again or being saved by grace through faith. He told them that they were begotten by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and encouraged them concerning the appearing of Jesus Christ. He assured this audience that they were both kept by the power of God and certain of receiving their reserved heavenly inheritance. As such, he, like Paul, reminded these saints of their responsibilities when he said that they were stewards of the manifold grace of God. When writing his second epistle, Peter reminded his audience of the truths contained in Paul's letters to them and claimed to have readdressed some of the same subjects. 2 Peter 3.15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, unstable, rest as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. This statement would certainly again validate that Peter's writings did not contradict what Paul had written, but instead built upon some of the same truths. Certainly, Peter would not suggest such things only to include a different gospel. If Peter's epistles taught a different gospel, he would never have pointed the saints to Paul's writings, which would have identified him as being accursed. Galatians 1.9 Interestingly, we can know exactly what Peter believed by reading about his interactions with Paul recorded in the book of Galatians. Peter, who believed in Jesus Christ, believed that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Galatians 2.11 But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. And that was referring to his hypocrisy. Verse 14 but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We, Peter and Paul, who are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we, Peter and Paul, have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Page 188 has the chart titled, Peter and Paul Saved by Grace. When did Peter understand Christ's sacrifice? Obviously, Peter understood Christ's sacrifice, the gospel, when he wrote his epistles. However, some people struggle to understand when Peter comprehended the complexities of the cross. Peter's interaction with Cornelius certainly sheds a lot of light to help resolve any potential conflict. The actual meeting was recorded in Acts chapter 10 with Acts chapter 11 expounding upon the details of the encounter. In recounting the events, Peter testified that God knew the hearts of the Gentiles and put no difference between the Gentiles who now believed and the Jewish believers. All hearts were purified by faith. Acts 15, 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. What gospel was Peter preaching to Jew and Gentile alike? It certainly was not the gospel of the kingdom, Luke 9, 6. Indisputably, Peter preached the gospel of the grace of God. In fact, after mentioning the death, burial, and resurrection, Peter stated, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, Acts 10.43. Peter knew the Gentiles to whom he ministered were saved by grace through faith because the Jews heard them glorify God through the gift of tongues. Peter continued, Acts 15, 8, And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness 
giving them the Holy Ghost as he did also unto us and put no difference between us and them, Jew and Gentile alike, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Peter believed that hearts, whether Jews or Gentiles, were purified by faith. The wording of verse 11 may seem strange, but it is important to recall what caused the assembling of the council. The primary point addressed by the council concerned the matter of salvation being identical for Jew and Gentile. The Jews and Gentiles were getting saved without circumcision, yet some men claim that circumcision or the works of the law was necessary for salvation. Peter, a saved man redeemed by the blood, 1 Peter 1.19 concluded by saying that we believe We shall be saved even as they, verse 11, without circumcision, because God put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, verse 9, without circumcision. The dispute among the Jewish brethren evolved around whether circumcision was a necessary requirement for salvation, as some men claimed. Obviously, any works added to grace would have caused salvation to cease to be given by grace. Acts 15.1, and certain men not called brethren, which came down from Judea, taught the brethren, saved people, and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. While it is obvious that Peter knew about the gospel, the grace of God, in Acts chapters 10 and 11, he was already preaching Christ's death, burial, and resurrection prior to his meeting with Cornelius. In fact, in Acts 1.22, Peter stated the requirement for Judas' replacement as an apostle. This replacement was to be ordained to be a witness with us of his, that is Christ's, resurrection. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preached the death, Acts 2.23, and resurrection, Acts 2.24, obviously including the third component, Christ's burial. Those in the audience who believed the message preached by Peter asked what they should do. And the initial answer was, repent. Matching Paul's twofold message of repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 20, 21. According to Peter, faith and repentance were to be followed by believer's baptism, Acts 2, 38. The contents of the gospel, the grace of God, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, was certainly the theme of the apostolic preaching, even before the spiritual ascent of the apostle Paul to prominence among the apostles. In Christ. The call to rightly divide the scriptures, 2 Timothy 2.15, does not mean that one should over-magnify differences in scripture while neglecting the similarities. For example, there is no doubt that there were differences in the ministries of the earliest apostles and that of the apostle Paul. And yet, there were just as many, if not more, similarities. Along these lines, there are unfortunately some that teach that no man was in Christ until the Apostle Paul. Of course, this is easily refuted with one Bible verse in Paul's own words, let alone the many others. Romans 16.7 Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Paul plainly stated that there were saints in Christ prior to his conversion. This makes sense since Jesus prophesied that once the Comforter, God's Spirit, John 14, 16, and 17 was sent, believers would be in him, that is, in his body. Jesus offered no qualification by stating that believers had to wait until after Paul was saved or after Paul penned his epistles. John fourteen seventeen. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. John fourteen twenty. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye are in me, and I in you. Christ promised that the Spirit of truth, the Comforter, would be sent down, and the Spirit was given in John. John 20, verse 22. All those who received the indwelling Spirit became members of Christ's body. John had the privilege of recording such truths both in his gospel account and in his first epistle. 1 John 5.20 And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. 
This matter of being in Christ obviously did not begin with Paul, nor was Paul the first to experience the supernatural benefit gained through the new birth. Jesus taught about it before Paul was saved. Paul claimed others experienced it prior to his conversion, and Peter closed his first epistle by identifying his primary audience as those that were in Christ. 1 Peter 5.14 Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is yet another Bible truth that bound together the ministries of Peter and Paul. No true Bible believer would ever reject the plain teaching of Scripture, even if it contradicted what he had believed and taught. He would gladly adjust his teaching to match the truth. This is unless he has become so entrenched in his dogma that he cannot receive the truth for the spiritual blinders. Once a Bible student sees any truth, a true Bible believer would change his belief and teaching to match the truth taught in Scripture. Those who relegate Peter's and John's epistles to Daniel's 70th week and then refuse to believe that people in these epistles will be in Christ have become Bible rejectors. If people are not in Christ in Daniel's 70th week and these books apply to that time, then the Bible contains contradictions or the person teaching such nonsense is simply wrong. You cannot have it both ways. Consistency must be the hallmark of Bible teaching. Understanding the Gospel At this point, one might wonder how there is even any debate about the similarities between the ministries of Paul and Peter. One might not understand why any Bible student would make a big fuss concerning differences. Before you dismiss someone for believing or seeing such differences, consider the delay on the part of the early apostles and understand the Gospel of Christ. Concerning the message they were commanded to preach in Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent the twelve forth to preach the gospel of the kingdom. This message did not include the death, burial, and resurrection because this same group did not understand Christ's sacrificial death, Luke 18, 31 through 34. However, by Luke chapter 24, Jesus had ascended to the Father and returned. Luke wrote that Jesus opened their understanding of the scriptures concerning Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Luke 24:45 Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and he said unto them thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day by divine design god never intended for the apostles or anyone to understand the crucifixion or the resurrection until after christ was risen from the dead the bible repeatedly teaches this truth from the outset of christ's ministry in fact with the resurrection contextually in view, John 2, verse 19, the scripture states that the disciples did not believe the word preached by Jesus until after his resurrection. John 2, 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. God intended for Paul to write about the revelation of the mystery, but this does not mean that others did not comprehend the changes taking place once their understanding was opened following Christ's resurrection. The point to grasp is that the disciples could not understand many truths until after Jesus was glorified. John 12, 16. After Jesus was glorified, before Paul was saved, people like Peter were preaching the death, crucifixion, Acts 2, 23, Acts 2, 36, the burial and resurrection of Christ, Acts 2.24, Acts 2.30. Claiming that they did so in ignorance simply displays a heightened level of ignorance and refusal to be corrected by God's word. The Blinded Prince With these truths in mind, a new question comes to light. Why did Jesus not want to reveal all of the intricate details of his death, burial, and resurrection? According to John chapter 14, Jesus limited what he had said and what he revealed because of the prince of this world. Jesus did not open the disciples' understanding concerning the things he said because he had a greater purpose. John 14, 28. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Any premature revelation of the truth would not be limited to Christ's intended audience. Yet God's intentions drastically changed after Christ's crucifixion. The truth no longer had to be hidden from man or from the wicked principalities. 
God's plan was satisfied, could not be thwarted. In fact, not only did Jesus testify to this point, but confirmed it through the words of the Apostle Paul. Satan would not have been God's pawn if the truth were revealed in advance. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained for the world under our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. All the pieces of the puzzle fall into place when viewed from God's perspective. The prince and the princes of this world could not know the truth about Christ's sacrifice until after his resurrection. The next verse sheds a completely new light when considered with these truths. Peter and John ran to the empty tomb on resurrection morning in disbelief, not because they wanted to confirm Christ's resurrection. John 20, verse 8, Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. With precept upon precept, the Lord finally opened their understanding concerning Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Up until this point, God did not see fit to reveal the truth to them. God's timing is important to recognize. Luke twenty four forty five. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Once the disciples' understanding was open, they were sent out as witnesses of the resurrection and the death and the burial of Christ. Acts 1, 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses, and that's proclaimers, unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. Obviously, these sent ones were to be witnesses, not simply eyewitnesses, but testifying witnesses of what Christ had done. In fact, telling others of the resurrection was the duty of every believer and was mentioned as the primary responsibility of the one ordained to be Judas's replacement as the twelfth apostle. The ordained twelfth apostle was ordained with the remaining eleven to be a witness with them of his, that is, Christ's resurrection. Acts one twenty two, Beginning from the baptism of John to the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. This was their commission and ordination. The twelve apostles were ordained to be witnesses of the resurrection through preaching. Now, footnote number one says some teachers have questioned whether Matthias was really Judas's replacement. The Bible confirms that he was with these proofs. Matthias was numbered with the eleven, Acts one twenty six. The apostles were called the twelve after Matthias was chosen, Acts six two. Paul referred to the twelve as having seen the resurrected Christ, first Corinthians fifteen five. Paul excluded himself from the twelve, first Corinthians fifteen, seven and eight. The command and justification to replace Judas is found in the book of Psalms, Psalm one oh nine, verse eight. So the twelve apostles were ordained to be witnesses of the resurrection through their preaching again. This was clearly manifested in Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost and in all of the apostolic preaching that took place during these earliest days. Acts 2.32 This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Acts 3.15 And killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Acts 4.33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Acts 5.30, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Considering the implications, although the information provided is correct, it is always wise to consider the other side. In other words, we should always be willing to ask ourselves if it is possible that we could be wrong in our approach and understanding. As such, we should consider the implications of a tribulation period application of First and Second Peter. If Peter's epistles are to be consigned to Daniel's 70th week, Consider only seven practical truths that Peter expressed concerning those living during this most horrible time on earth. Again, this is hypothetical. They are to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 5. Ye also are lively stones, or build up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 
Number two, they are to make sure that their conversation is honest among the Gentiles so that the Gentiles may glorify God. 1 Peter 2.12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. They are to submit to every ordinance of man. 1 Peter 2.13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king as supreme. They are to be subject to your masters with all fear. 1 Peter 2.18, servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. They are to take great care to ensure that they have godly husband and wife relationships. 1 Peter 3, 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning and plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold, of putting on the apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection of their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Number six, the men of God are to willingly feed the flock, but not for the purpose of gaining filthy lucre, that is, money. First Peter 5, 2. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And then number seven, they are refused to be like the world around them who despise government or are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Second Peter 2.10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government Presumptuous are they, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. This sampling of admonitions from Peter's epistles seems out of place if these instructions were addressing people during Daniel's 70th week. This period is going to be a time of horror unlike that experienced by any previous generation. Those who have studied this period in depth know the details and the inconsistencies involved with applying church-age principles to that time. With a knowledge of Daniel's 70th week, there are some inconsistencies with assuming that Peter wrote to saints living during that future period. First, why would Peter focus upon offering spiritual sacrifice when the first half of Daniel's 70th week will reintroduce literal, physical sacrifices? Does he advise them all concerning these physical sacrifices? Does he advise them at all concerning these physical sacrifices? Secondly, why would Peter advise people to submit to government and warn against despising the government when the government will be run by the Antichrist and submission to the government will be deemed disobedience toward God and eternally condemning? Additionally, why would Peter be so focused upon the husband-wife relationship and the way the wife tries to win her husband? During Daniel's seventh week, the believers will be under intense persecution, causing them to fear death daily. Unbelievers will be rewarded for turning the believers over to the authorities. Lastly, why such an emphasis on being a good employee when a job during that time would probably indicate that the person can buy and sell because he had taken the mark? This type of emphasis upon these particular issues makes no sense if the advice is directed toward those during Daniel's seventh week. Why would Peter's epistles deal with this subject matter above and fail to warn the saints concerning taking the mark of the beast or about worshiping the image of the beast? Why is there no mention of persecution suffering outside of that common to church age saints? Why would there be talk about money for the saints when the ability to buy and sell is only given to those who have taken the mark of the beast? Those who continue to espouse a tribulation application of First and Second Peter after seeing the truths from a Bible-believing perspective might as well close their Bibles because they rejected truth and accepted a lie. Summarization. 
If these biblical proofs are not sufficient to persuade the reader concerning the application of Peter's epistles to the church age, consider to whom Hebrews, through Revelation 4.1, was addressed. These books were written to Christian, 1 Peter 4.16, brethren, 2 Peter 1.10, in the church age, 3 John 1.6, and also verses 9 and 10, who were called in Christ's name, James 2.7, and saved by grace, 1 Peter 1.10. They knew the Savior, Jude one twenty five, and had an advocate with the Father for their sins, first John two one, and had eternal life, first John five, eleven through thirteen, and first John two twenty five, because they believed on the name of the Son, first John five thirteen. The chart on page one hundred and ninety eight is titled Addressed Christian Brethren One. These believers were in Christ, 1 Peter 5.14, 1 John 5.20, and Christ was in them, 1 John 4.16. They were sanctified, Hebrews 10.10, 10, and perfected forever, Hebrews 10.14. And they were preserved in Christ, Jesus, Jude 1.1, 1, 1, the author and finished their faith, Hebrews 12.2. These illuminated brethren, Hebrews 10.32, had obtained light precious faith through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. They had faith that overcame the world, 1 John 5, 4, because greater was he that was in them, 1 John 4, 4, and they were readers of Paul's epistles, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, who were running a race, Hebrews 12, 1. The chart on page 199 is titled, Addressed Christian Brethren, 2. These believers were begotten again by God's abundant mercy and by Christ's resurrection, 1 Peter 1, 3, and the word of truth, James 1.18, washed from their sins in Christ's blood, Revelation 1.5, and had an unfading, incorruptible, undefiled inheritance reserved in heaven, 1 Peter 1.4. They were kept by the power of God through faith, 1 Peter 1.5, with purified souls, 1 Peter 1.22, born again by the living and abiding word of God, 1 Peter 1.23, redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1.18 and 19, with their sins forgiven for Christ's sake, 1 John 2.12, had been healed by Christ's stripes, 1 Peter 2.24, and promised better things than the Old Testament saints, Hebrews 11.40. On page 200, you'll find the chart, Addressed Christian Brethren 3. These believers were partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4, dead to sins, 1 Peter 2, 24, stewards of the manifold grace of God, 1 Peter 4, 10, who labored in Christ's name without feigning, Revelation 2, 3, with full assurance of faith, Hebrews 10, 22. They were standing in the true grace of God, 1 Peter 5, 12, and purged from their sins, Hebrews 1, 3, 2 Peter 1, 9. Their hope was sure and steadfast, an anchor of the soul, Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. That as sons of God, they would be changed into Christ's likeness, 1 John 3, 2. Who received chastening as sons, Hebrews 12, 6 and 7. They awaited heaven, Hebrews 10, 34, as partakers of his holiness, Hebrews 12, 10. The chart on page 201 is titled, Addressed Christian Brethren, 4. Christ was their propitiation, 1 John 2, 1 and 2. Mediator, Hebrews 9, 15. Intercessor, Hebrews 7.25. Apostle and High Priest, Hebrews 3.1. Who obtained eternal redemption, Hebrews 8.12. And promised never to leave them or forsake them, Hebrews 13.5. Can anyone doubt that these brethren addressed in these epistles were Christians who were indwelled by Christ, had absolute assurance of salvation? The fact is that each of these same truths applies to every Christian today. Therefore, we must rightly divide the Bible, but not be guilty of eliminating key passages from application to all of us. Those who apply these church-age epistles to a future period are not Bible believers because they simply choose to remain blinded to the truth. Ignorance is certainly not an excuse because the evidence against such spiritual infidelity is overwhelming. The chart on page 202 is titled, Addressed Christian Brethren 5. Unfortunately, men are fickle beings especially those not accustomed to being confronted with their latent biases. Some preachers will refuse to swallow their pride because accepting the truth comes at too great a cost. Yet God warns the prideful not to allow their pride to bring about their own disgrace. 
Proverbs 16.8, pride goeth before destruction, haughty spirit before fall. Proverbs 11.2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with a lowly is wisdom. 1 Corinthians 8.2, and if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Even with all the evidence pointing to the intended audience of Hebrews through Revelation 4.1, there will be those who continue to dismiss this portion of Scripture as applicable to the tribulation with no scriptural support for such spiritual infidelity. Spiritualizing these teachings does not relieve the teacher from his responsibility of living according to the precepts found within these epistles.